I've been looking at your work for quite a while. And um, uh, as a matter of fact, I came across your work because of Alexander Dugan. And since this is an area that you all would veer off into, I thought perhaps we could maybe start with, it seems to me that we're, 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 we're swimming in a sea of ideologies that seem to rebrand themselves according to what segment of populations they are, are, are attracted to them at various points through time. And so in lieu of that, it also seems that we're starving for ideas. There's lots of ideology, but there doesn't seem to be any ideas that break across cross-culturally, that break barriers of, of culture, of religion, of borders. And it, there's nothing that is, can tether us at a more collective level, it seems, in the time that we're in. And I was wondering if you could maybe perhaps both of you start there about what, what, what can be done, what could be a catalyst for that in order to be able to create some coherence at a collect, more of a coherence at a collective level? Yeah, great question. Um, Michael, would you like to, would you like to start? start? Yeah, so one of the great contributions that Dugin, the Russian political philosopher and activist, has made on this question is he says the 20th century was primarily a century of ideological struggle between liberalism, communism, and fascism. And we can make sense of the history of the 20th century in that light until we get to the moment, roughly that we're still in, where liberalism seems like it's the only remaining ideology. There are no other alternatives. So in the 20th century, liberalism was one of a number of ideological alternatives. They struggled with each other and you could sort of see the tension between them and among them. But when fascism was defeated and when communism came to its end, liberalism went from being just one among a number of ideologies to dominating the entire ideological space. It went, as it were, from being an object in the foreground to constituting the whole background or the context in which we think and live. And that situation, it left us precisely where you just said, where on one hand, you have the repetition of the old ideologies, fascism and communism, but as kind of simulacra, not the real deal. It's, their, it's how they appear in a world where liberalism is dominant. And so you have all kinds of pseudo battles, as it were, between so-called fascists and so-called communists, and even liberalism has undergone this transformation. So we have a task, a task that I think Dugan helped us to get started with, in understanding the new ideological configuration and in seeing whether there are any sound intellectual alternatives beyond both liberalism and its previous dominant ideological enemies, communism and fascism. So the first speech I ever heard of his, he set out this idea of the fourth political theory where you need to get beyond liberalism, communism and fascism. That's the fourth. And as simple as that is, I think it captures a lot of what's actually going on. If you're not a liberal and you're not attacking liberalism from the left, by default, you're considered a fascist. And the language is so limiting, it's so constraining that things that clearly have nothing to do with fascism are being smeared as fascist or called fascist or interpreted as fascist. And this environment is suffocating the possibility of any genuine thinking, I would say, as well as any genuine discourse. Everything's automatically getting sucked into a set of concepts and terms that no longer apply and that just have the function of shutting down our ability to understand and our ability to discuss. So this is one of the places where he's extremely helpful. He opens up a new field for thinking and discussing that at least tries not to collapse itself into those previous ideological models. Obviously, there are some people who try to drag him back in and call him a fascist and call the people who think with him fascists, but that's just more evidence for the correctness of his original model, you know? So really the task, we need to be able to think, we need to be able to discuss, and we need the help of anybody who clears a space for that. Otherwise, we just have that recycled ideological atmosphere where it's difficult to breathe. Hmm. Yeah, what I feel like perhaps, um, also bringing in right at the get going of this conversation. Perhaps two questions. First, and I'm not talking about um, the 
so-called reasons why that is, why liberal democracy is the only kind of chosen way of what is being considered uh, today as a progressive uh, view of hu on, on human life, human interactions, society, which of course this in includes uh, economics and as a result immediately politics and everything and in no time we find ourselves where we are, where practically every single military conflict has been uh, in the name of preserving these values. One can argue that uh, to what extent that is true or not, but there are a number of people, including in the West, so Dugin in that respect is not alone. There are people, there are voices like this uh, within the Anglo-Saxon culture, within North America, who have been um, well very outspoken critics of the the very premises upon which the liberal democracy is being held as the ideology. So my question here is, and it's kind of a question in terms of why that is, why the liberal democracy is the only surviving ideology today, aside from immediately having the danger of <laughs> sliding into the all various kind of uh, potentially kind of taking us nowhere perspectives of, you know, from the, um, the, the very, very far of the con conspiratorial kind of I ideas that there are some kind of power. There is this uh, elite group of people who, whose goal, whose very aim is to maintain utter and entire control. Uh, whether it has some credibility or not, what I'm interested here in the fundamental question of why we find ourselves here in this point in time in history where liberal democracy turned perhaps even uh, upside down because in my own discourses I give often allusions to the very very provenance of what democracy is, where it comes from, right? We, it, it's inseparable from the cradle of Western civilization, where these very cherished ideas were brought to the surface, where that notion of demos was brought in and out, where it was propped by this understanding that what democracy is supposed to serve. But then it all becomes quite uh, vague. We know that democracy never truly, really, existed long enough anywhere as an ideology. I mean, even in Greece, it was a very, very short period of time. And like I give this example of Pericles um, conducting the construction of Acropolis whilst being behind the bars. So the, the, the democracy, uh, the democratic republic of the Athens ceased to exist already within the lifetime of one of its leaders and the greatest proponents of the democracy, Pericles was. And the second question, which is kind of uh, um, more subsidiary, I would say, to this main one, is what Alexander Dugin, or rather more precisely, someone like Alexander Dugin, because my understanding that he represents a certain movement, certain uh, intellectual, I would say, uh, direction that has been brewing somewhere deep, maybe within the um, confines, the periphery and the outskirts of the, not Russia so much, because we cannot speak about this country in strictly these terms, unless we give Russia a very different definition, not as a country alone, but more like a, an event, a shared space, a space of shared ideologies, as in fact often Russia has been referred to. Russia as a state, which has nothing to do with what, the, uh, what another term for Russia stands here. So this, what was brewing deep down at the very end of the uh, Soviet Union as a uh, 
as a system, some call it empire, okay, maybe it's an empire, I don't particularly myself see Soviet Union uh, to be on par with any existing empires, let's say like the empire of the United Kingdom, the empire of you know, France, France or Belgium empire, or the empire of the United States. And not because I'm biased that I grew up in Soviet Union, I grew up in Uzbekistan, which at the time it was still part, uh, inseparable part of the Soviet Union with its unique uh, Asiatic influences because it's Central Asia. So these questions to me are important because um, as I'm all for speaking about the specifics, and I love what you said, that that um, we not soon will find, but we already find ourselves in a very suffocating situation in terms of the freedom of expressing uh, certain ideas without being immediately labeled, framed, uh, And immediately what comes with that, because, you know, the labeling and framing here is the beginning, because then one uh, is being dismissed on the grounds of holding no valuable ideological platform, unless one shares that platform of what liberal democracy is understood to be today. So Yes, so I think we could say the pro-liberal democracy argument for why liberal democracy won is because it was the true teaching about the nature of human and political life and the true teaching about the meaning of historical progress that all history tends towards mutual recognition uh, recognition excuse me of our individual uniqueness and our infinite worth and that neither communism nor fascism reflected that understanding or that insight and therefore liberal democracy won because it deserved to win and that's kind of the argument that we've reached the end of history. History was a working out of partial teachings about the meaning of human and political life, culminating in the final truth of liberal democracy. And we should guard that moment and make sure that we don't backslide into some sort of reactionary anti-liberalism. But that's what it looks like for the defenders of liberal democracy. The people who, let's say, are willing to consider that that's not the end of the story, they have another account for why liberal democracy won. And I think that Dugans here is quite interesting. He says that the battle between liberalism, communism, and fascism was a battle for modernity, for the essence of modernity. Who properly has a right to stand atop modernity as its great champion and as the true significance of modernity? And the reason liberal democracy won is because it proved to be more modern than fascism and communism, each of which have some archaic or traditional or pre-modern components to it. So that's kind of like the pro-liberal democracy argument, except the question here revolves around the value of modernity as such. Is it in every way good? Is it altogether an improvement over the pre-modern? Or does it in some ways represent a forgetting of something valuable and ancient, a uh, narrowing of the horizons of what it is to be human and of the meaning of, politi of political life. So there are political scientists like Leo Strauss, he is for me the most important one, and philosophers like Heidegger, who argue each in their own domain that the trend from the ancient to the modern is a fall, as it were, that it's a distortion, and that therefore we need a return and some sort of recovery of what was lost, a return to the origins. Now, if that's accurate, then we see Liberal democracy was the most modern of the three ideologies. It was the purest expression of the essence of modernity. And therefore, it encapsulates in itself not only whatever positive contributions modernity made to our understanding of things, maybe like championing uh, human liberty is a big one, but it also is the most intense presentation of the negative aspects of modernity. Alienation, atomization, and... Uh, flattening out a shallowing out of the meaning of human life and if people experience that at all in their domestic politics and in international politics if they see how under the banner of freedom of speech and freedom of thought we have the exact inversion absence of thought and censorship of speech so how did that happen under the banner of liberalism everybody understands that it could have happened under communism or could have happened under fascism but nobody 
properly speaking, should have expected that the ideology of freedom would turn against itself in that way. So I think that not only Dugan, not only Strauss and Heidegger, but all the people today who are somehow criticizing hyper-liberalism or this new version of liberalism, this sort of monstrosity of liberalism, they are trying to put back on the table the things that modernity pushed to the side. So that could be sometimes certain forms of spirituality, of myth, of allegorization, of uh, different approaches to the meaning of material, to the meaning of matter, different attitudes and understandings of science. And that is a very positive development because in my view, at least, and here I share you know, the assessment of these other thinkers, when we flatten out our understanding of human nature, of nature and of everything else, we've lost something of extraordinary value, possibly of the greatest value. And so anything we can do to broaden our understanding of human capacity, broaden our understanding of the meaning of human life is a positive contribution. The concern that the liberal Democrats have is that you want to try to broaden your understanding of humanity, you're going to risk letting in all the dark demonic forces that we chased away over the course of the battles of the 20th century. So faced with this option, they choose, let's just close the door against the demons. Fine. Does that mean we amputated the human soul? So be it. That's the price we pay to keep the demons at bay. The other side says, well, just be able to fend off the demons and open the door so that you can let the angels in at least or let something in, let the higher man back into the picture. And I do understand the concern. I've had professors personally who, because of my work on Dugan, not only effectively blacklisted me from academia, but also had like a panic attack and really tried to guard, as I say, against these thinkers, Heidegger included, as a literal resurgence of the demonic. Uh, and they all recognize the risk. They all recognize the threat. They deal with it the way that they do. And my personal inclination, perhaps uh, yours as well, and certainly that of these thinkers is, let's just not amputate the human soul. Let's guard, let's have the psychic, uh, um, let's guard ourselves well enough that we can deal with looking at what somebody has to say without necessarily agreeing with every word of it. You know, that's how bad things have gotten, as I'm sure you know, and the people watching and listening know, things have gotten so bad that if you even read something or look at something that doesn't fall into the ideological status quo, you're considered as tainted forever with whatever is in there, the worst possible interpretation, like you touched poison and you became poison. The idea that you could entertain a thought that is different from what you believe is already pretty much seen as impossible or criminal. Well, I don't think that's right. That shouldn't be the case. And uh, all of these thinkers oppose that. Well, what you redress here, what you speak to, and there are certain points that I would like us to return at some point, but what suddenly springs to mind is the analogy of the organism. And since we speak about uh, here the human being, what it really means, what it represents, you know, we're going all the way back to revisit that um, Plato's notions on the being in terms of what human represents here, the Plato's idea of the f archetypal qualities that lay at the foundational ground of who we are and then what then constitutes the human condition. So all this, what uh, we observe now, and the symptomatology is all too obvious, and I like that analogy of the, you know, being done with, like being away with the demons, with the dark forces, right? So we, we cannot face it anymore, that the depth of that heaviness of the 19th century, right? This euphoria of entering the 20th century with this kind of a, um, anticipation of a new world that we are entering. That's what modernity characterized, even if modernity begins earlier. Uh, it is uh, universally acknowledged that there is this departure point that took place somewhere in the break of the 19th to the 20th century in arts and science, uh, 
in every domain of uh, human enterprise, that was true. So this, uh, what I want to bring to the conversation is the analogy of the organism, that when desperate often attempts are made to create sterile environment for an organism to function at its best, because otherwise it will uh, always in danger for being poisoned, polluted. Uh, the outcome, and we know it today now, even the allopathic medicine completely admits that, is the outbreak of all forms of uh, allergies. And what allergy now is in a kind of that uh, breakdown language for everyone to understand, is inability for metabolizing certain, um, inability to process something. So this analogy, when, whilst you, when, towards the end of what you were just uh, bringing out into the open, suddenly it popped out as that perhaps the whole analogy here of the human organism to the organism at large is what's happening to us, potentially, that somewhere we decided to flush out, flush down, that what was deeply uncomfortable because there was no way to process, to metabolize and to assimilate this what uh, inheritance of the centuries of religious uh, doctrines, or the division of what human psyche here represents, right? Divided between heaven and hell, with the uh, purgatory in between, that everything in the hands of the custodians, then that's out, at least for the educated, and the God is dead, as that Nietzschean uh, slogan, and takes us into the age of modernity. And now we find ourselves alone at home as these uh, adolescent beings, trying to make sense of that tremendous and at the same time horrifying sense of freedom of who we are, where what becomes the religion obviously is the science, which is um, a constant accompaniment of what makes modernity. Because when you said that, and it's correctly so, why liberal democracy won, because that showed its vitality. It showed that it won because it had the right to win against more archaic forms, um, more totalitarian forms. But with that, we shouldn't never forget that the success of modernity is inseparable from that delegation of our trust, that Sanskrit term Shraddha, that faith, that we take from the area which no longer, or which maybe outlived itself, and then being placed into the domain of what science or scientific breakthrough provides us with. And we run that euphoria for quite quite some time. So I would say in the early decades of the 20th century, maybe first half of the 20th, not fully half, because really the Second World War was the greatest disillusionment in my understanding of all these ideological backgrounds. We actually live in a not truly a com fully comprehended world of what the Second World War really represented. And it, it on one hand, there is no shortage of um, material that has been done since in, in our attempts to evaluate this, the greatest fall in terms of the, how can it even possibly be that European civilization, European here as Western civilization, can be succumbed to the uh, disease of such proportion. So the, and of course then someone might pro uh, object and say, well, it's not just Western European civilization. This extends across the globe, right? Because we went through some dark, dark decades, very dark time when uh, the horrifying nature of the human experiment was conducted on, on mass. And then it went into a different area. And so, like, and this is what uh, I particularly feel might have happened, is that when it went more underground in terms of that very unprocessed, unmetabolized forms of energy, that somehow this may begin to sound a little bit wacky to the listener at first, 
that that kind of um, because it had to go, it was forced to go into the unconscious. It was forced to go because there was no way to process it fully. No way to be understood consciously. I mean, people tried to understand Holocaust and then they were not able to do that. They were trying to reconcile and unable to do that. So it must have gone into the area where that traumatic experience lay sediment deep in the unconscious until there is more light to deal with it. So there is a possibility that the liberal democracy a kind of undergone a very peculiar metamorphosis within itself, as you have said, where the values of what it stands for have been turned upside down, right? In, in uh, quite an Orwellian kind of language, where everything goes simply, absolutely everything goes. And that could be the result of what you also pointed out, that sweeping or an attempt to sweep away this uncomfortable material that religion didn't quite help us to overcome because the Abrahamic religions did not give the answer to this question of human condition. It further kept the division firmly uh, binding a human being to these conditions. The, um, I mean, the counterculture and everything, it's, it's an obvious rebellion to that inheritance on the DNA level that our um, parents and our elders were trying to shake off collectively. You know, that, and this is also could be seen as that continuation of that euphoria of the trust into the modernity until I think we've reached the point where the there is an undeniable vacuum in terms of ideologies where perhaps fire has started in giving us that uh, a point of departure. How come we live in time when, in a way, the world is now designed, the world is there for us as that, as that like, playground for entertaining the best of the ideas, you know, to bring it out, don't hold back. And yet, it meets with a tremendous confinement and psychological, uh, almost, I would say, incapacity to come up with everything. So this is also, is a very important um, not to discard that it's the end of trust in science that also brings these culminating points in terms of the where the modernity reached its point when it doesn't lead anywhere anymore. It doesn't provide anything. No incentive for why even to wake up in the morning. What is the reason better for this life? Yes, the modern, the question of modern science, the meaning of science and modernity, science and ideology is a big one for the reasons you mentioned. And it's something that Heidegger, Leo Strauss, and Dugan, the three thinkers most important to me, all do pay some attention to. So one of the problems is that when we put our faith in modern science, and we also have, this is a point Leo Strauss made, a division between facts and values. So science deals primarily with facts and doesn't deal with values. We're left in a situation where there's no rational answer, assuming that science is our metric for rationality there's no more rational answer for the meaning of a life right raison d'etre just like you said how should we live what's the best way of life what's worth striving for and what's not worth striving for the classical teaching including plato's had an answer for the best way of life it taught us something about what we should strive for and it was rational but because modernity equated rationality with science and it said that science is not competent to say anything about values, it decoupled rationality from the ends of human life. And that left us in a situation where you are either all in on rationality, in which case you're not paying attention to the ends of a human life, or you are interested in the ends of human life, but you don't believe that reason can say anything to you about that. 
So it set up a schism where you have rationality equated with science and irrationality or art in a way equated with life. And there was no longer the possibility of a well-ordered life that was also rational and not just limited to science in its absolute dominion. One of the things that Leo Strauss tried to do in this situation is he said, yes, we have a crisis of rationality. The crisis is that we've lost our purpose, we've lost our direction, and science can't direct us. But it's a crisis of modern rationality. It's not a crisis of rationality as such. In other words, there's a possibility to return to pre-modern rationalism, which didn't limit itself to science in its absolute uh, domination. And so that's how he, that's how Leo Strauss went back to Plato, for example. He opened up the quarrel between the ancients and the moderns. He said, our crisis of rationalism, the crisis of modern rationalism, we're going to restore the possibility of a pre-modern or ancient rationalism, classical political rationalism. Heidegger, Dugan, they navigate this situation in slightly different ways. Somebody I think who's very valuable and important to all of these thinkers is Husserl, one of the key figures of phenomenology, because Husserl said, look, we don't have to reject science. But what we need to do is think it through. And when we think it through, we'll see that our dogmas about science don't tell us how science is even possible. How is it possible for us to have constructed an explanation of reality that matches mathematical projections with physical phenomena? You know, so once you think through in a way that is not easy or obvious, the presuppositions of all scientific thought, like Husserl tried to do, you, you have another way of transcending the limitations of a absolutely scientific outlook on the world. Because the problem, again, it's, no, it's in no way, okay, when we talk about the limitations of liberal democracy, we don't mean to denigrate its true contributions. There are obviously good things about liberal democracy. It's the bad things that we're worried about. Same with modern science. It's not like the domination of modern science offers nothing valuable. The problem is that when it sets itself up as the sole authority for the interpretation of human life, then what it leaves out of the picture is quite, it's dangerous for it to have limited things that way. So phenomenology, the study of classical political rationalism, and these other approaches, they all allow us in my view, and in the view of these authors, to take one step beyond science including it possibly the Heidegger, for example, doesn't say we need to reject science. He just says we need to go to the ground of, to its origin, what it stems from the existential ground of the possibility of scientific activity in the first place. So the problem with all of these approaches, which incidentally I fully subscribe to, I think all of these approaches return to Plato phenomenology and others as well are extremely valuable. The problem is that they are not so easy. A person first has to notice, the dominance of science in our world interpretation has to see that it's cut out thinking about the ends or the meaning of a human life or the raison d'etre has to be able to think through these difficult authors and difficult sources and ideas you know that force us to get to causality and interpretations of matter and time so it's a huge task but somehow it's necessary it's necessary and one thing i want to add because obviously there are people who are doing this and who have done it and thought about it. In most cases, the people who took a step beyond modernity, I think we can call them postmoderns for our purpose. So the postmodern thinkers, the ones who try to inaugurate the continuation or the next version or something, they have tended to be thinkers who on one hand took us beyond the dominance of modern science and therefore rightfully deserve to be called postmoderns. But on the other hand, exacerbated some of the tendencies of modernity. So my big discovery, partially while working on Dugan, but preceding it slightly, my big discovery about postmodernity is it's primarily a phenomenon of the left. And that means that it's like still only one half of the whole story, because there should be a way of thinking about postmodernity, a way of overcoming modernity that doesn't automatically go to the left. Now, for some people, it's a gross simplification to talk about left and right. But I hope, you know, for all intents and purposes, roughly, right, we can categorize thinkers and their attitudes towards equality and hierarchy and tradition and archaics and religion, spirituality, uh, and all of those kinds of things in terms of left and right, roughly. Um, And if that's the case, then we also could 
benefit from postmodern thinkers who are not on the left. And that's a pretty narrow group, strangely enough. Heidegger himself was not on the left. Nietzsche himself was not on the left. You know, Husserl, these other thinkers who are instrumental for getting beyond modernity were not on the left, but they were all appropriated in academia and in ideological circles by the left. So most people today who know Heidegger or who know Nietzsche know the left wing version of Heidegger and Nietzsche. They criticize science from one perspective. So not because I'm primarily interested in defending the right wing, but because in my view, we need to have as broad a picture as we can work with. And given the fact that the right postmoderns are missing and the left postmoderns dominate, I think we need to put right postmodernity back on the table just to help fill in our model of pre-modern, modern, and postmodern. But for sure, for sure, for sure, meditation on science is going to be a big part of that in any event. Yeah, well, this already began to happen within uh, scientific communities quite quite some time ago with uh, some of these more, I would say, canonical examples like the quantum physicist David Bohm, who at the height of his career suddenly uh, turns completely, does the U-turn, and goes and sits and spends time with that uh, spiritual teacher, Jiddu Krishnamurti, which um, became a very, very well-known uh, association between the two. And the decision, or rather the driving force behind that, uh, on the part of someone like David Bohm, was his dissatisfaction with that what you just spoke about in terms of rationality that the science deals with, that the science almost self-isolated itself from any possible uh, overlapping with that territory what all of us are here experiencing in calling life. And I remember myself when I first encountered that, this is very, very, just like maybe as a, as a footnote, it coincided with my coming to the West, actually already to London in the very, very early 90s, in 1991, where I became aware of the conference or congress that was held in Amsterdam, which was entitled something like arts meets science and spirituality in the changing of the economics and of course it had this most illustrious gathering of like artists of its of its time S scientists philosophers thinkers you know this is where dalai lama still very young you know because this was i think it was 1989 1990 uh, facilitated by the art um, moderator, um, art critic, um, I forgot her name, I think she was, she was a close friend of uh, Joseph Beuys, the German post-World War artist. And so she brought all these people together and, and I came across of the thoughts of David Bohm at the time, where he was confronted with this crisis, with this dilemma that how come science, when it reached this point at the level of the quantum, which was a complete and utter revolution in the beginning of the 20th century and throughout the middle of the 20th century, does not address such notions as love and compassion. And that became a, a, a kind of like a, almost self-inflicted psychological a burden that he began to carry within himself that led to his deepest disillusionment in what science can actually offer in terms of what it promised to offer. And I agree with you that science cannot be dismissed on the accounts of it's not providing with an overall, all-embracing, all-encompassing answers to the problems to the modern human is now faced with. We know that very well. 
But at the same time, the uh, these ideas, right, they were in the air after all, right? Like the the famous Einstein, you know, like attempts of finding the theory of everything, right? What was that line? Give me God's thoughts and, you know, the rest are details or something like that, I'm paraphrasing, right? Just give me the th God's thoughts, the rest are just semantic, the rest are details. So there was this, again, I'm talking about that, you know, like this, as if we're coming so close, there was this collectively shared um, feeling that we're coming very close to something radically, radically different that will pave the way, a breakthrough, a true breakthrough from the centuries, from whatever, from that tremendous sense of um, what we've been carrying collectively as a race, as a human race. And the example of someone like David Bohm, of course, he was, he became an, in no time an outcast. It was natural, right? He chose that for himself and he became, um, well, he was, he was just simply reticled, almost on par of losing his mind. You know, how can men of such brilliance at the height of his career go suddenly to India and sit next to the Indian teacher, right? The Jiddu Krishnamurti was a world-renowned teacher, but nevertheless, uh, the stigma was there and he never recovered from that. He never was uh, accepted back into the academic circles. So he had no choice but to continue his uh, investigations into the domain of consciousness, as he put it. So this, his implicate order, the work that he's known for, that implicate order was perhaps the greatest contribution to that um, predicament that the science has met face to face with in terms of what it actually provides, what it offers, where its limitations are, and, you know, is there a way to overcome that? And that also brings me this to another personal encounter, which was actually took place in um, when I started to come out to teach, and I was invited to the these events that were at some point very, very became very well known, science and non-duality conference that uh, originated in California by this great uh, organizers, enthusiasts, you know, who were trying to bring people from all different walks of life under that same umbrella of what that earlier mentioned by me uh, conference in Europe and Amsterdam was, this attempt at bringing science, spirituality and arts again together as fragmented disciplines that at once were all perhaps under the same uh, notion of alchemy that's what alchemy was. Alchemy was art, science, and spirituality. And it was inseparable. So that, that fragmentation took place somewhere and allow each discipline to flow through its own kind of restricted channels. Because once they begin to flow through its restrictive channels, the, what it represented in its togetherness began to be gradually losing the direction of where it flows. So in other words, it was no longer flowing anywhere where it can take someone somewhere. Arts be art became for the art's sake, and I, myself being a professional artist for a good you know, portion of my life, right? Like the, I can tell you that um, it, um, it's a very, very interesting also example of this. It's, it's, a, it's a model, a mirror of modern life. Not in the sense of mirror, in terms of as a creative mirror. That in itself, what happened in, was accepted, promulgated, promoted in arts, became very much a parody, you know, an irony, a sarcasm of inability to come up with anything that what we speak of as that raison d'etre. So that what was highly praised is just that sense of irony, a, a passing comment on something, nothing that can take your... Uh, beyond, let's say, confines of one's uh, current status, what the cathartic quality in art really meant to afford, meant to lead, it meant to inspire, it meant to bring some metamorphic qualities into the human psyche. So this 
Um, attempts, we can see the, the attempts, and I would also would like to get back to that, what you were saying uh, previously in, in, towards that crisis between modernity and more archaic beliefs. The crisis between modernity and that what modernity runs over almost like a, it's like a it's like this bus of modernity it's like this kind of like a, it it has no regard for because the whole point of modernity that it disregards and the postmodernity then tries to restore the uh, the postmodernity is characterized by this um, sentiment of trying to remarry or bring back that what was maybe um, run over, right, to restore that, um, restore that and reconcile, reconcile, so because there is this nostalgia immediately, right, that we, there's immediately sense of a tremendous loss of something valuable that modernity alone cannot provide, no matter how much we can ride its hype, it exhausts itself and we are falling back into what? We're falling back into this body, the seat of emotions, feelings, what it means to be alive. We're falling back into this human condition. And in that, in that, this what we speak of also, is this, uh, it's that constant dance, this like, I don't know, it's like the tango, it's like attempts of moving forward, and suddenly realizing that that move forward is at the expense of tremendous sacrifice which we can't afford. So therefore these values are began to be revived. So when I was speaking at these science and non-duality conferences, of course I had the chance to meet brilliant minds of our time. And I was on a panel actually on Kashmir Shaivism with Sally Kempton, a senior tantric teacher of our time, and Menas Kafatas, who is a a brilliant quantum physicist. And I remember when we had these private exchanges with Menas, and he said that there is, like, within the scientific community, there is a there is a big rupture between those, like he considers himself, who has this more consciousness-oriented platform perspective, and those who consider all these people to be completely balloony, you know, that they, that they, they, they completely disregard and the rupture grows. The gap between is only growing, it's not shrinking. So there's like, uh, it's being dismissed as new age, it's being dismissed as, uh, as soft science, it's being dismissed as basically lacking in what have you. But there, are, there is a number of people who are not afraid to speak about it in a broad daylight, to teach like Menes himself. And so, it's interesting because I remember also that kind of, uh, I don't know how fitting that is, but when we talked about consciousness, I remember his remark, the term consciousness is being used so much since the 60s, that the more I hear the term consciousness, the less I understand what it means. I quite frankly prefer Shiva, you know, and it's like, you know, we will both laugh because it does have that different traction, you know, it has this archaic ancient quality, that the term much more sterilized term consciousness doesn't. It's too stripped of something, you know? It's given an attempt to give that term a new meaning, like, like it's a name for new God, right? After all, for God's sake, that's what consciousness means. It's supposed to have that uh, rational explanation, or at least a term in English vernacular, for what at once God stood. And Menace's remark, which was, I thought was brilliant, you know, I prefer Shiva. Yeah, that is a good way of dealing with words that have become so emptied out through common use, consciousness being one of them. If people actually paid attention to what they think they mean when they say consciousness, they should be blown away. They should be stopped in their tracks to understand what it is that they're talking about and dealing with. But it's exactly just become an ordinary word. I like what Heidegger said here. He says that all essential words have lost their power. So language has become so emptied out that even 
being. He said being people talk, talk about the word being like it's they just use it like it's talking about, I don't know, a cup or a fork or a spoon. It's lost. Language has lost its ability not only to enchant, but to cross the threshold from yeah. non-existence to existence. It's, so I think that if you have the shocking effect of going to a different vocabulary, that, that can be a useful way to shock somebody out of their um, complacency and start to get them to think again. That's something Heidegger did, incidentally. He used words, he spelled words differently at times, yeah. and he just yeah, used famous, familiar words sound. in unfamiliar yeah. ways. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what it takes in a way to shake somebody out of their complacency. But there are other things in what you said that I think are very important as well. So the fact that uh, Baum, is that how you say it, or Baum, uh, David, or, or uh, the scientist, like Baum, the fact that he was la laughed at for meeting with somebody outside of the Western scientific establishment, and the fact that there are still people today who could be laughed at for uh, going outside of the Western scientific establishment shows you still the lingering kind of racism at the heart of Western science that tries to say nobody else anywhere has developed a model of understanding things that we could learn from. It's so condescending. And it's not just that it's condescending, it's that it's not accurate. It doesn't even know whether it's accurate because to test its accuracy, it would have to be at least as familiar with other models of understanding as it is with itself, which it isn't. And it can't be because it's close to the possibility. So that loop, that closed loop that says, we're not gonna learn from anybody else other than ourselves because nobody knows more than we do. And anybody who goes outside of our closed circle is gonna become a pariah. That I think is still roughly the case. There are some critics of modern science who I think fall into the left postmodernism camp and they say other ways of knowing yes there are other ways of knowing and we can learn from aboriginal traditions and we can learn from other traditions but my concern with that approach is that it limits the other groups it's willing to learn from to groups that it considers marginalized or oppressed or victimized so for example I'm a, you know, Western, let's say Western academic. I studied in a department of political science in Canada, and I had people in my university who were open to the other. That's how they present themselves. So they wouldn't have a problem with a dissertation on Aboriginal alternatives to modern science, but they were completely closed off these same people to the possibility that I could learn something from Russian conservatism, for example, or from an Islamic tradition, perhaps, right, or from some other way some other school that's not reducible to ideological uh, leftism so there are all of these obstacles in the way the racism that doesn't want to learn from other cultures the leftism that only wants to learn from oppressed or victimized cultures and somehow our desire to know well in my case i, I identify that as the dominant force the desire to know it has to break through all of those limitations one after the other but I think that it's a real problem. And another one is now, not only do you have the problem that you mentioned where the split in terms of consciousness and its significance of consciousness, but you also have what you mentioned earlier, the drive towards transhumanism, artificial intelligence, and the idea that even if we talk about consciousness, we're gonna reduce it to computation, we're gonna reduce it to um, calculation and algorithm. And so you have that merging of the most radically technological arm of modern science and this deeply human sci science of consciousness or study of consciousness in a way that just collapses the two. So that risk, the risk that we're going to take human consciousness or Shiva or however we refer to it in whatever system we call it and technologize it with transhumanism, or artificial intelligence, or some other model, that starkly stated puts humanity at risk, the human essence at risk, the human being at risk, that which makes us what we are. Uh, and so that is another kind of, I think, threat to understand. So I'll give you an example. I say this is a polemical, radicalized version of this issue, but Dugan and some of his supporters they have said that we have now a conflict between the Great Reset and the Great Awakening. 
The great, we, the great Reset is the project of overcoming our own humanity in the name of freedom. So we liberated ourselves from monarchs. We liberated ourselves from external sources of authority, according to this narrative. Then we had to liberate ourselves from internal hierarchies. So we liberated ourselves from the dominance of rationality. Then we liberate ourselves from gender identity. And eventually, if we take it all the way to its conclusion, we'll liberate ourselves from human identity. So we'll cast off the fascist chains of being human, just like we cast off the fascist chains of being a man, just like we cast off the fascist chains of being peasants or serfs or whatever. So the logical process of liberation on this polemical, but still kind of logical account, is that we free ourselves from being human altogether. And the only possible alternative, if we're setting up a dyad here, is all of those groups, wherever they may be, whatever tradition they may participate in, wherever they are geopolitically, uh, geographically, everybody who says we want to preserve the human being on one side and we want to overcome the human being on the other. So in some sense, I mean, Dugan presents a variety of models, each with its own degree of polemical intensity. But this one, the Great Reset versus the Great Awakening, I think has some value to it. It's true, there are tendencies that want to liberate us from ourselves. And there are other schools distributed all over the place that want to return us to ourselves, that want to somehow reconnect us to ourselves. And maybe the schism that your friend talked about in the study of consciousness between these groups, maybe that's a schism that is just running everywhere. It's running everywhere in the world in all of the domains and regions of human activity. On one side of the schism, the movement towards technological universalism and the erasure of the human being, or as they maybe see it, the, the, the transcending of the human being. And on the other hand, all of those movements that want to assert beauty, worth, value, love, tradition, something embo embodiment because you can't have it embodied transhumanism can you i don't know i don't think so if you're downloading your consciousness onto a microchip i'm not exactly sure where the embodiment there factors in so it's possible that that division is just somehow the new version you know you had a time where either you were a liberal or you were a communist and somehow that affected your writing and your art and your thinking and you know your architecture and everything and possibly this line, the defense of the human being or the overcoming of the human being is another such line. So it's really quite amazing. I want one other thing I just wanted to say. So we both mentioned that there are postmodern thinkers who are trying to recover the archaics that modernity destroyed or um, took out of the equation. You said it quite nicely. But there are also people, it seems to me like, uh, Yoram Hazoni, I don't know if people will recognize his name or not, he's a political theorist, or Jordan Peterson, probably a more recognizable name, who on one hand try to restore some sort of non-modern thinking, like either because they talk about Jung and archetypes and alchemy in the Bible or something like that. So they're trying to recover something, but they're not doing it as postmodern thinkers. Somehow there's still a modern rough they're somehow modern but they are still trying to recover something pre-modern in a way that's different from these other thinkers so that's just another curious division you know not everybody's out there talking about young who has a huge platform peterson obviously is but at the same time he's warning against postmodern uh neo-leftism and all of this kind of thing so he's kind of like a modern recoverer of something semi pre-modern yeah very interesting. I have some analogy to to bring to, to that. But Michael, let me open the shutters a little bit. I think the light's going to start. The, the sun is setting. I don't want to lose light completely into the frame. So what this brought me as a kind of a, I think, fun example of that. What may, some people may not find this contradictory. But it has this element, it, and simply to illustrate this, um, everyone knows that Andy Warhol uh, was kind of like a, a figure who made 
a very distinctive impact on what would be understood to be uh, American art, because all uh, artists prior, we could argue, Andy Warhol, even though like the, the whole movement of the field painters, uh, American uh, abstract expressionism, de Kooning, you know, Jackson Pollock, right, uh, Mark Rothko, like you know. All these artists were still very much European in the sense of their approach, even though they departed completely from the traditional forms and they were doing something else. It doesn't matter, they were still leaving marks on the surface, which were supposed to carry some aesthetic uh, impact, or rather emotional impact through the aesthetics that that would provide. And then suddenly we have this uh, a Campbell soup right suddenly we have this um, prints of just photographs of of marlene monroe in different colors right and we have this matrix you know use of the print you know the but the iconic work is of course is the campbell soup right so it's kind of bringing into the gallery the a radically new idea, not that it hasn't been done in Europe, right? It was done in the beginning of the 20th century already, that uh, the work of art becomes a work of art as soon as it is brought into a context so one can bring an object, so that it's called ready-mades. Marcel Duchamp already pioneered that. But what's interesting about Andy Warhol is that for all his radicalism in a sense of how he presented himself as an artist, and there was plenty of that. In his private life, where he lived, he was surrounding himself with a very baroque kind of furniture, with statues that one can only find somewhere, I don't know, like the plaster casts, or maybe once he started making serious money, there were probably a real marble versions and copies shipped from some antique shops, you know. But they were very, very much what would be considered to be a, an outlive bourgeois value in terms of his personal setting. And it was very well known that he actually liked to be surrounded by a very different decor than what he brought to the gallery space, by exhibition space and sold, you see, for what he was known. And that simply serves here as that example of inconsistency because it is an inconsistency, because it's not coming from a place of authentic belief in what one does. Even if art historians and critics will argue, well, that's precisely the value of Andy Warhol. That's precisely his contribution and blah, 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 of course. And it's like produced a whole um, generations of uh, artists who were trying to outsmart that, you know, and, and continue in that, you know. But that analogy is to what you were saying in terms of this um, flirting, you know, like within the cultures, you see, it's these preferences. It's that inconsistency because that inconsistency is born out of essentially losing the plot. There is inability to live in an authentic way in terms of what values one holds to, because this is a dissolution of the center. There is no values are left. So therefore, with that dissolution, there is this, everything goes, right? The chaos theories and what have you. But going back, and this, I would try to build the bridge between this and what I'm about to say in reference to what you were pointing out as um, what I personally call in my vocabulary as uh, intellectual imperialism or in intellectual colonialism. It's a consistent attempt at having one way or another an upper hand at interpreting and evaluating the cultures that are otherwise remain to be impenetrable, opaque. 
to the uninitiated. And it's very, very um, a distinctive sign because it has uh, precedence and deep roots in the origins of the colonialism. The, coloni colonia the ideas of colonialism are based on having to have a scientifically based validation of inequality between the races. You cannot have racism without its being backed up. And we know such works were made in the past. Not just attempts, there were manuals, that, there were atlases that were dissecting human uh, body in various ways, particularly the skull and you know the, all that sagittal and lines of the um, of the form of, of the um, of the formation with the, in in direct attempts at conveying that certain races undergone greater evolution therefore they are master races so of course this is are all ideas of the past nobody would dare to bring them out and you know they, but what I'm trying to say here is that it is that attempt still remains. It's still somewhere not outlived fully by the approaches that we encounter now in terms of how these ideas are being represented and how these ideas are being confronted by those who consider themselves standing on a more evolved platform which was all too apparent in that conversation between Levy and Dugin at that duel, that, they, that famous duel that they had, right? You could feel, you could sense the sense of intellectual even superiority of the Levy over Dugin, who almost uh, have been dressed down as that kind of like a dinosaur or, or, or kind of like a, uh, not quite, I wouldn't go as far as to say that he downgraded him in obvious manner but the downgrading of Dugin was done precisely with this very same um, in my understanding in my kind of sensitivity with that same approach of how the whole science of Egyptology Indology was found how the Brits and the Germans back in the days were interpreting and evaluating the very, very evolutionary unfoldment of Western civilization from its cradle, you know, like that it has these elements very strongly still today, particularly I find in relation to the inheritance of India, which um, only has its now 70th years, year of independence. So, it took a long time, a very long time, for a new pleiad of independent scholars to come out in order to challenge these voices that were there. Because the tradition, you know, certain traditions are hermeneutic by nature. They're not open to a foreign traveler. And what we live today in, we live in the time of tourism. Really, we well, live in the time of literally tourism here uh, could be a term uh, extended on what and how these attempts at interpreting and evaluating uh, certain cultural preferences and prevalences. It's been done repeatedly now with the position that Russian culture finds itself in, where the voices of the likes of Dugin here challenging these perspectives because Russia, let's not forget, and this is what I find in, I myself find very interesting the position of Dugin, so maybe we can return to him a little bit more in this conversation because Russia always had that problem, a problem of identity in terms of its belonging. That problem of identity here is characterized by its not so straightforward history and today I'm in the possession of some uh, 
information, I don't want to call it facts, that Russian history has been repeatedly um, rewritten, not just because it was rewritten during the Soviet times. Actually, it was rewritten more so um, before, so as to give it a kind of semi-mythological position within the Western culture. So Russians often, I mean, and I'm talking about now, Russian intellectuals always wrestled with that belonging. Belonging. Where do we belong? Do we belong? Like, in, if I were to speak on behalf of Russian intellectual, which I cannot because I was born in Central Asia and I've lived, I mean, I've lived in London for the largest part of my adult life. So, and yet, of course, being a native Russian speaker, I can certainly contest to that dilemma of being torn between the Asiatic and Byzantine roots and Western kind of uh, um, almost being kind of barren, almost like the, that kind of a sense of not quite knowing whether they belong or not. And this has particularly been uh, brought to a certain degree of intensity with the attempts of turning Russia into a colonial state with its foreign um, leaders, Tsars, right, foreign monarchy, with the Peter the Great's attempts at so-called educating and cutting Russia from its deep Byzantine and Asian roots, so as to re-educate Russia into this new kind of belonging to Europe, St. Petersburg being the very, very uh, symbol of that attempt, because St. Petersburg is an invented city, it's a magnificent city. It's a city, there's only maybe three, four cities in the world, in the world like that. Paris and maybe Manhattan. Not the whole Great New York, but just Manhattan. St. Petersburg is like a sculpture. It's a conceptual work of art. It has no place there to be. It wasn't a result of some kind of organic settlement of people. It's a, a decision of a one man to create a city. And that man had no limits to his uh, capacity to do that, you see. So he literally like materialized that, a dreamlike idea, and St. Petersburg came into being. That's what they've done. And it was a <laughs> it was a, impossible to, to build there, you know. And they had to bring bring hundreds of tons of sand just to dry out of the mire and all that kind of, you know, that very, very, very wet soil and to create canals like in Venice because the idea was to create a northern Venice or it, at least in Amsterdam and Peter the Great wanted. So this, of course, brought this uh, strong connection and, uh, you know, that Russian people carry within themselves. So I think what Dugin um, and many of his contemporaries with whom he is associated through that Yuzhinsky circle, the underground circle, which enjoyed the status, like the cult status in its, of its day. And the people like um, Gaydar Jamal, uh, Limonov, you know, who became thinkers, they were all very close friends of Dugin, that the, they began to question the place of Russia in a much more acute way whether Russia actually belongs to that grand plan and whether Russia can actually be uh, treated in a sense of the values that are uh, all too easily people saw that, you know, as a vast territory for a new market, speaking in geopolitical terms, with the collapse of Soviet Union, everyone suddenly saw Russia, well, okay, that's the end of the... Um, Cold War, you know, that's the end of the division of Europe, right? So, well, it's 
tremendous opportunity for a new market. But something else began to happen. So there are the formation of these uh, political forces that led to today's Russia, where uh, many people, when they want to throw this against Alexander Dugin today, they call him brains of Putin, right? They, 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 they have that against him, that he's the ideological, he provides Putin with the ideological ground. Of course, this is a terrible simplification uh, of the real dilemma that Dugin brings out into the open in terms of the place of each and every culture, let alone cultures such as Russia, India, China, because these are cultures which are civilizational. They carry in themselves, even at the DNA level, dare I say, certain frequencies, certain aspects, which cannot be found anywhere else. And it is valuable for that very reason, because they are belonging to that uh, a code that if it's eradicated, then it's gone. And as going back to what you were saying just a short while ago, that these attempts at uh, right that whole Silicon Valley kind of ideas of this, you know, new technocrats and the billionaires of our time, right, the, the wealthiest people of our time who turn themselves into into prophets also, right, to prophesize where we're going is deeply troubling, deeply worrying, because it literally uh, proposes much more sinister perspective than anything we can imagine. So I'm completely with you on that in terms of the shared sentiment of that, of these concerns. Yeah, so something that Dugan helps us to see, I think, is that if we say we're rejecting post-humanism, we're rejecting that tendency, and we're going to reassert either spontaneously or because we have a deep philosophical understanding of the issue, the meaning of a human life, what we see is that human beings differ civilizationally. That for him is pretty much axiomatic, I would say. So Dugan believes that the world consists of civilizations, that the civilizations are distinct. Each one is fundamentally different from the other. We don't know in advance the nature of the difference. It's a task for us to learn the nature of the difference, which I think is a deeply respectful attitude to have towards civilizational plurality, one that absolutely the Western liberal lacks. And anybody who has not seen the debate, I say quote unquote debate because it could have been one, but instead it was just a condescending encounter of Levy and Dugan, should watch the debate and in my view also read Levy's book because one of the amazing things, and I hadn't read his book until after the debate, uh, one of the amazing things is that you can see Dugan had read Levy thoughtfully. And I got the distinct impression that Levy had not read Dugan thoughtfully. And that's exactly what you would expect. Dugan trying to pay attention to what somebody else thinks at, out of respect and at the level of the intellectual model and interpretation. And Levy just assuming that because he's a Westerner and Dugan's a Russian, Levy has the upper hand. That just reproduces exactly as you said, all of the past relationships of a colonial and racist kind. Now, the amazing thing is that Levy in his book says, the United States has become an empire with no purpose. It's become an empire of nothing. And if it doesn't find a purpose, there's going to be a resurgence of civilizational uh, forces. So the book is called, I think, Empire and the Five Kings. And he says, if the United States doesn't get its act together, then you're going to have a rise of China, India, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Russia, which basically Dugan can agree to that thesis. Yes, the United States is an empire of nothing. Yes, it's lost its purpose, it's become a sort of nihilistic abyss. And yes, the response is going to be a new multipolar civilizational world. But they weren't able to talk at the level of the basic thesis. And Dugan at one point says, as I'm sure you recall, he wonders whether Levy even read his own book, because if Levy had agreed with that thesis, then they could actually discuss the metaphysics of multipolarity. But they couldn't. The condescension was just in the way, as it always is in these kinds of encounters, unfortunately. So, yes, Dugan has spent thousands of pages 
writing about the meaning of Russia's being, the meaning of Russia's place in the world, the meaning of Russian history and of Russian identity. He's developed a well elaborated model of Eurasianism or Neo-Eurasianism, which takes the insights of the thinkers of the 1920s and 30s about civilizational plurality and enriches them with all of the new intellectual models that developed in the meantime, including Husserl and Heidegger and those Heidegger is the most important thinker for Dugan in my view, but he's supplemented the original thesis of the Eurasianists with these new theoretical models. And he's written so much about it that's fascinating and helpful in articulating the meaning of Russia's distinct civilizational identity. What always amazes me, even though you know it, I know it, and it's predictable, is that Western scholars who want to, or say they want to understand Russia, they don't even read past the first page of books like this as a rule. So here's somebody who's written thousands of pages on Eurasianism, thousands of pages on the meaning of Russian history, identity, philosophy, thought, theology, poetry, literature, and everything else you can imagine. You would consider him to be a very rich resource for anybody in the West who's trying to understand Russia. And instead, what happens, his books are banned from Amazon. He himself is under sanctions in Canada and the United States. And people like myself who work on him are effectively under a institutional blacklist. So that just shows you the unwillingness to study these things. But yes, what it means to be a civilization, a distinct one, that, you know, not, none of these questions are obvious, even if they seem so initially. What does it mean to be a people? What is, it, what is the relationship of language to being? Do people differ only superficially, like in what they wear and what they eat? Or do the, do the differences run deeper? So I'll give you an example. Dugan's second book on Heidegger, Martin Heidegger, is called Martin Heidegger, The Possibility of Russian Philosophy. Now, I started translating this book, but because he's under sanctions, I can't uh, release it for publication until I get government clearance, which I'm sure I won't. But anybody who reads Russian can look at it in the Russian or just get my quick summary here. And one of the things Dugan says is a people, like the Russian people or German people, a people has a different relationship to being as such, as reflected in their language. So I won't go into the details because I don't want to lose anybody who's not into Heidegger or these topics, but just to be brief about it, he takes Martin Heidegger's work on human existence. And in his first book, he translates the German into Russian roughly one to one so that you could treat the Russian as equivalent to the German. That's good for introductory purposes. His first book on Heidegger is in English and it's good. And that roughly is the goal to present Heidegger to a Russian speaking audience without the influence of so Soviet ideology. Okay. But in his second Heidegger book, he says, let's actually pause for a minute and raise the following question. Does the Russian translation of the German term mean the same thing as the German term? Is it actually a strict equivalent? So there are many words. You're a native Russian speaker. You probably have this experience yourself. I was born in Canada uh, in a Russian speaking household. I have this experience where a translated word, it evokes a completely different world. It's the quote unquote same word, but somehow it's completely different at the same time. So if that's the case, he says, let's hone in on that strange feature of language. So for example, Heidegger had to develop a, a sort of what seemed like an artificial language to say some of the things he wanted to say. He had to force German into weird formulations that are weird even for a German. What Dugan observes is that when you translate a lot of those words into Russian, you can do so with common Russian words. So what was uncommon in German becomes common in Russian. And here's the punchline. He says that shows us that the German people and the Russian people, as evidenced by their language, have a different relationship to being as such. And that's the level at which he thinks the civilizational differences are really rooted and really relevant. So a liberal, I mean, among the various other ways they might think of this, they would say, look, I'm a multiculturalist. On weekends, I eat Indian food, and during the week, I eat Chinese food and Greek food. The, the multiculturalism is superficial. It's at the level of 
not that there's not that food in itself is superficial, but the attitude of the contemporary multiculturalist is superficial. It doesn't say, yes, I'm, today I'm going to study the foundational Russian poets and tomorrow I'm going to study Heraclitus and the next day I'm going to study the great texts of Chinese civilization, right? It doesn't go to the depths. But Dugan's view is the depths are where the civiliz civilizations differ. And so something, again, that the Western journalists who write about Dugan don't know and don't want to know, he has a 24 volume book series called No Omachia, like Nus, intellect, and Machia, war or struggle. And this 24 volume book series is a philosophical analysis of civilizational multipolarity. So he has like five volumes on Africa, you know, five or six volumes on Russia, several volumes on these other civilizational spaces, because that's what it takes to actually get to know a civilization, to start to get to know a civilization well. You have to do that. You got to learn languages and get into the details. So in my view, independently of the anti-liberalism, somehow independently of opposing transhumanism and post-humanism, if we just stop with the perspective that civilization is an important theme today, the meaning of civil, like, you know, the plurality of civilization, civilizational cycles, that there can be civilizational collapse, uh, civilizations with their own somehow pulse, you know, the, the meaning of Western civilization not being equivalent to the meaning of some other civilization. One of the things that he helps us to do, gives us the tools for, the methods for, the uh, philosophical methods for, is to study that seriously, to put civilization on the table as an analytical tool. Um, all of that somehow is necessary. I mean, I think people in the West, I just had a conversation this morning with somebody who's very much working on civilizational cycles, a uh, different theory, not Dugan, but still the topic of civilizational cycles. And he said, and I think he's right, that we're kind, it seems like we're experiencing crisis after crisis after crisis, and that this intensification of crises, political, social, and otherwise, economic, are suggesting that our current tools of analysis are missing something important. And the plurality of civilizations and the cycles of civilizations not to mention uh, other approaches to the human being, you know, maybe their Indian approaches, maybe what they're from the kinds of traditions that you teach. All of that should have a renewed relevance if we find ourselves in a crisis situation with no tools to make sense of it. So Dugan fits into that. And I just want to say something too for people who are not familiar with his work or uh, only familiar with it in passing. Even though I'm referring to him as my main figure here, in his own writings, he refers to many other authors that he draws on for his understanding. So sometimes they're the Eurasianists, sometimes they're people like Spangler, Toynbee, as you mentioned, Huntington. So I say Dugan, but Dugan is also encapsulating in himself and often referring to all of these other thinkers from other traditions. And, you know, why wouldn't we want to enrich the way that we analyze these situations? Clearly, we don't have the adequate tools. As a, I mean, what the West, Western thinkers as a rule right now don't have the adequate tools to deal with these problems. So we should be hungry for alternatives that teach us anything instead of being closed to them at the outset. I really think that that debate between Levy and Dugan is a good snapshot of the limitations, you know? And as much as people might dislike Vladimir Putin and Russia, as a warring state or anything like that. And as much as people might love high French culture and civilization and see that embodied in Levy or some sort of defense of a freedom and of human dignity, still, I think the worst thing that could happen to us is that we have that kind of condescending outlook that makes it impossible to learn from anybody else. You can reconcile a love of liberty, love of human life, a desire for peace and not war, you can reconcile that with a genuine respect for other cultures and civilizations where you don't just uh, lecture to them, but learn from them. And I, I personally, just given the, the um, accidents of my own background, I personally regard Dugan as an outstanding representative of Russian intellectual and philosophical uh, work. Clearly not the only one. As you said, there are other people from his early circles and there are other living Russian academics and philosophers and poets and everybody. But just again, 
my, I'm most familiar with his work and I've seen it to be a huge contribution. So whoever's listening to this, whether they're, they know, you know, I'm sharing it in my circles, you're sharing it with your students and somebody just clicks through it. Uh, that's really my, my pitch and my appeal, not only for Dugan, but for the serious study of alternative perspectives without collapsing them and without being condescending towards them. Um, yeah. Yeah it's, yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful and it's a very timely, timely remind as well. What you say about this, um, and what you rather point out in terms of the emphasis that Dugin made with regard to the linguistic differences and how the language through which we speak or the language that speaks through us is not just some kind of uh, insignificant affair. I want to bring, bring this analogy here with um, how Vedic understanding, Vedic here, Tantric as well, of the language, because language is a primal expression of consciousness. And there are these four levels of speech that the tradition speaks with. These four levels of speech, which basically all the way from the unmanifest level, that level of speech where it's just pure undisturbed silence, we could say. Right? That where nothing, everything is in a state of complete and utter union and unity. Nothing is agitated, nothing is, has even tendency to express itself. It's like that silent level of speech. Then there is a movement and within that movement it is still molten, but it's filled, pregnant with potentiality. This is the Vedic perspective. And then there comes a distinctive point where there has to be for that swelling within, for that propensity for self-expression, it has to carry itself forth. So it breaks, breaks into a different state. And that's the third state here is uh, characterized by breaking from pure form of energy into something more particular. In other words, we can give analogy of wave collapsing into a particle, like in the double split experiment. So that's what now has been pure energy and waves becomes something particular. So in other words, these are the origins of thoughts, origins of mental activity, but not yet articulated. It's still in a state of non-articulate uh, condition. And when it begins to then progressively collapse into what is then known as the fourth, there's a specific term, fourth, because there are four stages, it becomes a concrete idea, thought, which then can be expressed either verbally, orally, or in a written or simply a reflective format of contemplation. So, consciousness is expressing itself here through the language, and language becomes the primal tool of the expression of consciousness. And the differences between the languages carry very specific vibrations. So, in other words, I'm just bringing this as that analogy of this, in other perspective, understanding why it is important that these distinctions in the language and like in the family, let's say if we are viewing ourselves literally in terms of the uh, family of very, very different cultures, including those that are living somewhere in a small part of the world, just like literally on the level of the tribal society, which doesn't leave impact on the rest of the world in a direct way. It is very important within, within the domain of consciousness itself, because that's where the potentiality broke itself out into something manifest. It became something particular. It spoke. It manifested as something. So 
what we also live now through is a certain degradation of the language and deterioration of the language itself. The deterioration of the language here is not even so much in terms of its grammar, but in terms of what language represents in terms of communication. And that's again, we can link that to this technological progress that demands the language to become a simply a util like utilitarian form of communication. So in other words, it's removing the very purpose and role that language plays here, the unique role, because each of the languages here. So I, I'm not familiar with the work of Dugin on the differences of the languages, but it certainly pickled my curiosity, what you just said, because it's completely on par with this understanding that some languages have a different ways and some languages carry in themselves a certain, let's say, purely on a vibratory level, uh, frequencies which potentially have the capacity for conveying that what no other language can convey. No other language can convey. So, therefore, we are here um, speaking about something extraordinarily unique in terms of the impossibility of accurate interpretation in a sense of what translation here stands for when it comes to what language can communicate. Because some words, they carry these vibrations which are irreplaceable. And the poets who try to translate, they know it's like a pain. They, they, it's very well known among the, the men of letters the, uh, that swelling sense of trying to bring that quality that one has experiencing and has access to in one language into another language fails there and then. It's particularly obvious in and through something which is as simple as folk songs, something which is very, very well known in the culture, you know, something which can, one can almost whistle. You know, try to translate that. It makes no sense. It loses itself there and then immediately. It doesn't carry any emotional uh, charge that it otherwise conveys. So, to me, this is this is very very interesting, and certainly that dismissal is at the expense of impoverishing the globally shared culture. You know, I don't know whether this is can be spoken of in terms of uh, linking it to the the way the Anglo-Saxon culture, but it's not just because we agreed, it's not just Anglo-Saxon culture. We can see that these tendencies were there when French language was more kind of pri had primacy over English. I mean, the primacy of English language now is due to a lot of factors, but one of the undeniable factors is it's the language of technology. Whereas there were times where French language was the language of the sciences and the language of the educated. So, I don't know where I'm uh, taking it from here now, but just thought to speak it out. I might need to put a little bit of light here. This topic of language, in my view, it does take us back to the start of the conversation on what's going on ideologically. Because ideologically, people are trying to make sense of what's going on or put their will across so affect what's going on but somehow it seems like a lot of what's being said is not rooted in understanding and it's not rooted at the deeper level so it's another task for us as we try to work through the current ideological situation to have our you could say you know to bring our speech to a uh, higher vibration or to have our speech go to the rooted levels of one and two, as you mentioned, right? One, two, three, and not just have it uh, 
it's kind of like on those four levels, we're missing levels one, two, and three right now. All language is just operating on four, but the carpet has been pulled out from under it. So the tasks are quite large, but they're all related somehow. They're all related in my view to rooting our understanding where it's been uprooted, restoring the ability of our language to reveal the way things are, no longer disenchanting the world through a narrow version of rationality, obviously rationality and speech closely related as well. So that is in some sense the task. I mean, ideology is our attempt. It's in the word, at least ideology. We have the logos part of it, our speaking, our speaking in accordance with some idea that we have of the world, with some vision that we have of the world. It's a kind of worldview. So if we've removed our ability to see things clearly, our worldview is not going to be very well configured. And if our language has become impoverished, and if we have all of the wrong ideas, our ideology is also just going to be a speaking that lacks direction and a speaking that lacks foundation. So this is all related. And Dugan is one of many people who is doing his part. And I think uh, you and I are each doing our part to try to restore a rooted, powerful language, a way of seeing the world and speaking about the world that actually connects and that actually orients us. So that's how I would uh, link where we've come in the conversation to where we started it. And in my view, that's a nice overview uh, of the topic. Mm, love it. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. The only thing is that I find so contemptible is that in Russia itself, among Russian intellectuals, what I find deeply surprising, or rather found, not so long ago, uh, that Dugin enjoys this very, very um, same, a very ambivalent reputation, particularly among the young intellectuals. He definitely has a cult following there, don't get me wrong. He has a cult following there. But I've watched some of the interviews in Russian that he gave, and he's very generous in his interviews. Very generous, like with what you have said, like after all, uh, he is a living, true philosopher of our time. They dime a dozen. It's not like we are spoiled by great thinkers of our time. And yet there is this immediate dismissal all on the grounds of that all too quickly shared consensus that coming from the sources that we know it coming from, because it comes from the indoctrination, it comes from dismissal. And of course, uh, it, uh, it is extended deep into Russia, where these young minds, this very, very, um, well, they are our contemporaries, this, you know, these are your contemporaries, these are my contemporaries, these are people of different generations. And I find this uh, as a peculiar and also a troubling sign of our time, that philosophy is... Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, just one thing to be clear, you mentioned, uh, you said he's a dime, uh, dime a dozen. I think you mean the opposite, right? That he's rare, it's rare to yes, have. Yes, that's right? what so I dime, meant. Dime a dozen yes, sorry, typically no, means, no, yeah. not dime a dozen. Just to be, no, so nobody's confused, right? To have no, a no. living, true philosopher is a rarity, right? Very it's such rare, a real exactly. rarity, yeah. yeah. And so it's like, and yet, there is this almost immediate, anyone who tries to speak or brings Dugin's name, in the context of a conversation where uh, it, it, it really pains me to see that. Pains me to see that because it also shows immediately the, that harmful impact of that one kind of level that cuts everyone under the same measure. It's like this um, inability to stand for one's own 
viewpoint which is required. That's what is doing encourages and asks. He is controversial for all the right reasons. You know that he brings forth some of the most uncomfortable and most important and challenging questions. And and that comes from that very generation of those um, lesser known thinkers because they did not leave such an output, I think, you know, like that, um, the work that you mentioned that, you know, it's often referred to, it's, I've, I've heard about it, I've, I'm not familiar with it, but of course, um, you know, he's a prolific writer and just um, that fear and that a label that is being attached to him, you see, and that label and then the, the fear that comes with that, you know, that, oh, Dugin, the, so that must be some kind of uh, immediate association with the fascist elements in Russian culture. And that's terrible because that's a, a complete flattening and dismissal of the complexities to which he actually speaks. So I'm just saying that because hopefully for the for those Russian speaking uh, listeners who if they come across this conversation so they will be less quick to follow that kind of you know fast forming opinion and go and find out about it directly to, from the sources of his work so you're going you're doing great job you're doing great service in my understanding in translating and it seems also that it comes at like you holding this uh, holding to your own beliefs comes at the cost which is i understand and i totally totally you don't need to tell me it's it's challenging to be dismissed and outcasted so i hope that uh, there are some openings that will bring the new newer audiences and you know that because there is a hunger there is this uh, desire definitely you know among the younger generations in particular even when i read uh, some when i came across some of the comments underneath your uh, deliveries and you know they're very very promising some of these comments thank you thank you so it was a great joy speaking, Michael, and it's lovely to meet you, in, even in this format. So, Likewise, I'm glad we had the chance to. I know it took some time to set up, but it was, uh, from my perspective, worth, uh, worth the wait. So stay in touch, please. If, you know, if there's a chance of us to meet physically, that will be a, even a greater joy. Absolutely. I haven't traveled in the last few years, but I hope to start uh, traveling again soon. So, Inshallah, as they say, <laughs> where I was born.